Uh, all right, so I'm going to share my screen with you. And da -da -da. hold on just a second. All right, what are you guys seeing exactly? Um, it's like the whole app or application. Okay, let me, uh... all right, are you seeing a big slide here or are you seeing? It's a big slide. All right, are you st still seeing a big slide? No, now we can see. My notes? Like... Yeah, yes. yeah, we see. That. Uh, all right. Well, hold on just a second. Okay. Yeah. Well, screw it. We'll just uh, go with that. Okay. Um, so I know that you guys kind of presume to have learned the majority of this um, as you move through foundations. However, there's a lot more to archival processes and practices than you probably know. Um, and as you move into a more professional capacity, um, you're going to have to think of things like, you know, wiring paintings so that it can handle 150 pounds, um, learning how to potentially submit work that um, is based on a cleat rather than a wire so that the work cannot be stolen off of the wall. So th there are varying things that curators and um, art galleries will ask you to do that maybe you might not necessarily be aware of at this point. So if we're thinking about archival practices, why would you want to care about that? Um, so basically, you're thinking about materials and supplies. Uh, archival basically just means that anything that is a long term, anything that is in long, long term contact um, with important objects, it is safe, safe and stable um, to both the museum and library standards if it's like literally meaning archive. Archive actually means paper. So, um, why you'd want to consider all of this is if the work is actually for sale, it needs to live in posterity. So, will it go into collection? Um, if you're in a public or private collection, you have a kind of um, you have a kind of contract, an ethical contract. Um, so, what does that mean? That means you have to take into consideration the object's longevity. How long will it be permanent? How long will it last? Are the materials doing that for you? Is the presentation doing that for you? Is there museum glass on your work on paper? Can it actually handle being put in the sun in a collector's home? of their uber fancy modernist, you know, well-lit space. Um, all of those things need to be really, really taken into consideration. And it can be sometimes not very cost-effective, especially for young artists. But when you start to make money on your work, this is something that you wanna, you wanna think about. Um, so lots of early mixed media works um, use things that weren't archival. Um, and I'll talk about a few artists that, that actually did that. So cardboard is not archival. Um, Toulouse Lautrec only worked on cardboard. Did y'all know that? Um, fugitive paints. Fugitive means it's not going to last. Um, acidic glues. Um, so like really strong adhesive bonding. The spray that they use in graphic design for mounting is not archival. Um, conservators generally are faced with these issues. Um, and what their job is, is to extend the lifetime of those things. Um, if the work is looked at exclusively as experiential, then um, that's not necessarily a contract that needs to be honored. So one of the people who was kind of most guilty of committing the sin of non-archival production is a guy named Albert Pinkham Ryder. And he was an early American, 19th century uh, American painter. Um, he was really well known and he was known as a kind of tonalist landscape artist, um, he, highly collectible. Very, and you may not have heard of him, but highly, highly collectible. collectible. He um, would, <laughs> he was admired for the luminosity of his colors, 
but he actually painted lean on fat, which means he painted um, with more paint out of the tube over glazes. So you know the fat over lean rule, fat over lean rule. He did the reverse of that. And so what happens is his paintings are really crumbling off of their surfaces. Um, he used non-drying oils. So he would put an experiment with various oils adding into his paint. Um, he would add things like candle wax because he was cheap instead of beeswax, which sometimes had additives in it. Um, bitumen, which is an, a sort of additive as well to give it viscosity. Um, and he just kind of did not care when he made his paintings about what he threw in them. Um, so his paintings pretty immediately started to darken, crack in, and fall apart in his lifetime. In fact, um, they have to basically put his paintings under glass to hold the chips from falling off of the surface. They're that fragile. Um, and of course, you're all familiar with what happened here, right? Um, so art conservation includes the principles and practices of technical examination, documentation, and the treatment for objects in a material culture. Um, the point of conservation is to improve the condition of the artifact by actually stabilizing the physical condition um, of problems that might um, well create a kind of surface dis disfigurement uh, that generally arise from deterioration or damage, natural deterioration from time, right? Um, sometimes when the artist actually makes a work in this way, that is an entirely different problem that requires an entirely different solution. Um, so the art conservator generally wants to retain as much of the original material as possible in order to employ the best quality materials um, and the most carefully considered methods available. Um, there is a sort of ethical standard now that didn't exist always in history that art conservators cannot actually permanently alter a work. Did you all know this? So even if the work is chipping off, the glue that they use to put it back on there has to be removable. Um, there is a famous Buddhist monastery in Tibet that is a great wonder of the world. It's not an official wonder of the world, but it is stunning. And it, it was created as a wall painting, not a fresco. So it's not actually a part of the wall. And it's been damaged from, by moisture and by smoke, right, from all the meditation. And so our conservators basically were brought in by the state to fix it. And when they did, they did not permanently do this. They went in with watercolor and in painted all of the cracks, all of the, the absences of the actual wall painting. And pretty much the state, uh, so the Chinese, because um, Tibet has been um, you know, basically illegally taken by China, um, were really upset because this was a primarily Western practice of not altering the work permanently. And so the idea was, well, if it rains in here, it gets wet in here, this thing is gone because it was watercolor. So this is a, this is a thing that really is ever changing and the ethics and standards of this is, is, is constantly changing as well. Um, so, and you're all familiar with Leonardo, hold on, I think I might be getting a text from, no, I'm not. Um, so Leonardo, um, if either uh, student texts you that they're waiting for me, let me know. Raise your hand and wave at me. Um, you all know that Leonardo was a huge um, perfectionist, but um, he didn't find fresco painting to be ideal. And so in his way, he was very slow. And so rather than waiting, you know, working the entire time for the plaster as it's drying to create the fresco that he did here in the Last Supper, um, he went back after it was dry and did all sorts of things to the surface, adding oil paint, um, using kind of big tempera, like, and he went back and he went back and he went back and it took him forever, right? And so within his lifetime, this image started to fall off the walls. Um, so when you see a good image of this online, it's actually a, a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a lie because in, in person, it's, it's really, really um, in harsh condition. So generally, um, the thing that really hurt this was the environmental conditions of the space, not necessarily just how he made it, because the environmental conditions of the space are always going to have an effect on an artwork, no matter what, right? it was exacerbated by his experimentation with the surface itself. So a 
after you know hundreds and hundreds of years of this smoke and this soot and this the people breathe this was used as a room like a refractory like um you eat there like so so like monks would eat there nuns would eat there breathing in the um sort of moisture and out moisture also is playing a role in degrading this artwork so there was an extensive conservation it took about 20 years it was completed in 1999 the year after i graduated high school by the way um yes i'm old uh so that what they did is they would work on small sections and they would remove the previous retouches um they cleaned it with basically uh, like a dawn dish detergent and toothbrushes um, and they added a kind of beige watercolor to the parts that could not be recovered so when you see it it looks like the wall is underneath so all that gray that you see in that slide it's the wall um, a lot of critics argued that the restorers had moved so much of the painting that so little was left of the Leonardo original artwork that it it drew into question whether or not it was even his anymore right um really though if we want to keep it there was really nothing to be done um and intervention had to be made so francis bacon was also notorious for being a bad boy a sinner of the archival practice uh, he painted directly on unprimed uh, canvas in fact he would buy pre-primed linen or pre-primed canvas usually linen and he would paint on the opposite side um he presumed he assumed that because the the canvas initially being pre-primed had been uh sealed with a layer of rabbit skin glue because that's what you actually should do in an archival practice is rabbit a glue either polyvinyl acetate or uh, which is like white glue or um rabbit skin glue then a lead ground like a white lead paint ground worked in with a trowel or a, a metal um, palette knife. He presumed that since it was probably sealed with the glue that he could work directly on the back and not have a problem with it. So far so good, but in all actuality, the paint, the paint is absolutely degrading the surface of the, of the canvas. And what you see are these sort of oil, you know when you drop a chip, uh, like a potato chip on a piece of paper and that oil slick starts to grow? That's what the paintings start to look like now. Um, so he was known to be pretty negligent and he was known to be negligent um kind of professionally but also personally um he would throw all sorts of things into his paint as well like sand and grit from the studio um the next slide i have uh two slides of his studio itself which this one doesn't look too bad but this man was an absolute raging alcoholic i mean raging alcoholic drunk by eight o'clock in the morning first thing he did was slam hard alcohol um, he would spend most of his day painting and then about three, four o'clock in the afternoon, he would go to a very famous bar, a pub, and he would hang out with a lot of really well-known artists. You would Uglo, if you like him, Lucian Freud was one of his friends, and they would just pound him back all day long. And so his concerns about posterity and his work living in uh, a condition that was, that was salvageable uh, really, really were not um, a, a primary concern for him. Um, and so I think his alcoholism did directly affect um, his contribution in terms of uh, being an object maker. Leon Golub, I asked you guys to watch a short video of his. I hope you did. Um, Leon Golub is a very well-known artist. Um, he's, he's shown for America in the, in the Venice Biennale, as has his wife. Uh, there's an Art 21 on his wife. Um, so he made paintings of sort of torture images huge paintings of torture image you see that this image is 120 uh by 176 to give you a, a, an idea of that the mural that we have currently up in the painting room is 120 inches wide so he makes gigantic paintings of a politically motivated politically charged images that really do investigate the notion uh notions of power right and the abuse of power so his signature technique was very very different than anybody else's uh, what he would do he was he would paint these figures onto canvas, typically on the floor or on a wall, and then he'd put it on the floor, and then he would um, flood them with um, like acrylic paint, like really quickly. Uh, so he'd, he'd do all the detail work, and then he would flood them with acrylic paint, 
over the oil and on the floor, take like a scraper, like a metal scraper and scrape and pull all of that wet acrylic down almost like he was um, squeegeeing it out. And so they create this sort of surface that really is like a stain, but like a scrape stain. So they're intentionally hideous. Um, and it, what it does is it actually pushes, and he does this from the backside, this pushes the paint up to the surface and sort of bleeds out and pulls it down. So it's really, a, it's hard to see his work and understand and appreciate the surface quality without actually being in front of them um, because they're meant to look horrible. Um, the idea is, is that the form will follow the function in terms of what he's investigating regarding his, regarding his content. Um, so, I mean, he's literally like using a cleaver on it. Um, and then we have Anselm Kiefer and hopefully you all know Anselm Kiefer is one of the most important living artists working today. Um, this is called We Live Upon the Ruins. Um, it was a signature piece of, a, of an exhibition that he did. And he's well known for creating these sort of semi-abstract landscape paintings, essentially landscape paintings, massive landscape paintings. Um, and we've got a little quote here. Um, we live upon ruins. History is the progressive accumulation of ruin upon ruin. In the end, capitalism, that abstract monstrosity of totality, would have been a machine for the production of ruins. And so really, he's, so he's post-war German. And so a lot of his work is, is very charged by not only being the child of, of sort of the shame, of living with the shame of what Germany did um, in the Holocaust, but also just simply um, an, an, an absolute attack on the decadence of Western values, which really is about wealth. Um, so he's trying to investigate through the means of like architecture and the landscape uh, by defiling that and making it appear as though it's a sort of archeological ruin. Um, this is a sort of decay and degradation of, of, of the human spirit. And of course, his work uses all sorts of things in it, glass, oil, um, dung. I have uh, a comment. I yeah. noticed he was not wearing like both of the artists, the last artists, but their shoes, they trust their art way too much. The lead. Because you're yeah, talking about the lead and like toms yeah uh i i'll tell you what um when i was in graduate school they had a metal foundry pouring weekend and everybody would go and get uh really wasted and pour molten metal and one year uh some drunk kids were pouring from the crucible um bronze and of course they were sloshing it around and one of the kids was not wearing steel toed boots and it went right through his foot, one of those oh. drips. Um, and so they, they shut it down for a year or two and then kind of renegotiated how they how the approach that they were having to safety. Because like, and, as I was like watching like his like little documentary thing, I was just stressed the whole time because I'm like one wrong splash and that would just like go straight through his toes. Well, I haven't done a total deep dive into the structure itself. I have no idea how the actual structure, the, 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 the um, substrate underneath can actually withhold that amount of lead in terms of weight. Because um, it, it it's lead, it's heavy. Yeah. So, and these things are permanently affixed in these museum spaces. They're not moved around a lot. But they are, they are really a problem in terms of keeping them alive. One of the best Anselm Kiefer pieces I ever saw was a piece that actually destroyed itself because it was in a collector's home in Austin and it was a, an enormous book. It was like seven foot, eight foot wide and like four foot pages that he had done these drawings on. And each page he had dipped in um, ceramic slip. And so it had hardened, kind of fossilized, but it's slip, it's not fired. And it's paper, so it's malleable, it's flexible. And so every year, the collector was asked to turn a page of this gigantic book. And so it would destroy the page and the drawing that was on it, that everything would just break up. Um, How's that in terms of like, what's the word? Uh, like it, oh, I forgot the word you literally just used. The ethical the contract of selling yeah. an object? Yeah, because do people purchase this or like did that person purchase it knowing they would eventually be without this? This is a, exactly the reason why we're asked to put on our placards the materials involved in making a work. Oh. 
So when a work is sold, and, and not, not only that, but his oeuvre, I think, speaks to this. His intentions are meant that the, that the artwork is going to kind of fall apart. It will not live a thousand years like a Van Eyck will, right? Um, it is about degradation, literally and figuratively. So I think, you know, if we think about what that contract is, it's presumed that his work will do that, but also any collector who's worth their salt, who's selling work for those types of funds, it is meant to be mostly experiential. However, its form comes in, in, the, in the form of an object, much like an installation. How do you sell an installation, right? Um, you sell an installation oftentimes based on the archive of that installation, the photographs of that installation, prints, video, right? A website for that installation. So that's when it becomes like a, uh, like a question. Um, another artist who sort of breaks this rule is Odd Nerdrum. Um, I've shown Ar Odd Nerdrum, I think, to you guys maybe once or twice. Um, he's a Scandinavian artist who, um, you know, is super, super wealthy. He owns his own island. He makes these sort of ridiculously, he makes throwbacks to me the medieval era. Um, and he makes, I would call them sci-fi paintings. They're very strange, they're figurative, they're very classical. Um, he took out a full page ad in Art Forum about 20 years ago telling the world that he was the next Rembrandt, that he was the new genius of Rembrandt manifest in the world, like the resurrection of Rembrandt, right? Um, and otherwise, he actually follows a really strict protocol in terms of the creation of his work. So he really does follow, um, 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 archival practices. However, however, when his work arrives in America, a lot of the time it's produced so quickly that it's still wet. And when an artwork is, it, when a painting is wet, it's generally shipped in a crate, a stiff crate. Um, so if we look back at that image right there, his work, um, I heard this wonderful story that um, his work, it, because they started to fall apart as soon as they got to the States, because they were created in such a rush, um, collectors started to go after, um, Frank's up, my little Frankie's up. Um, he's my dog. Uh, they started to go after the gallery forum. And it got to the point where they would hang a work of his at forum and they would have to turn the works upside down at night so that the painting would not slide off of that surface, much like one has to do for an Albert Pinkham writer because gravity is the worst enemy of a, of a wet painting, right? Um, and we're talking, you know, not that thick, but fairly thick because he's using like traditional things that a, that a, that a medieval or a Renaissance painter would use, which would be like walnut oil instead of galcad. He's not using anything but what a Renaissance artist would use. And how long did it take to produce those paintings for them? You know, how, how long did it take them to dry, right? Um, and then of course, Jackson Pollock, right? Um, Jackson Pollock was using all kinds of things in his paintings, um, including car enamel, um, model car enamel as well, house paint, aluminum paint, all sorts of paint that in the 50s was like the newest, you know, it's the bee's knees because it's new and it has new colors and it's so interesting. But he was also a raging alcoholic who could care less about the kind of, the kind of you know, permanence of his work. So um, our, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a nightmare for um, conservationists. There's this great story that I heard from one of my former art history professors where she went to a Jackson Pollock show in New York in the 80s. And she got up close to the painting and she had seen that he had let a cigarette butt fall into the paint. And she went, ha ha, oh, cigarette butt, funny. Yeah, of course, yeah, he cared about that. She went all the way around the exhibition. She came back and she saw that the, ex that the um, cigarette butt had fallen on the floor and popped off the painting. And before you know it, four people are around that painting, quarantining it off, freaking out about this painting that's literally falling off of its surface and it's just a cigarette butt. And so the, the next week they're in there with, uh, um, with tweezers and uh, archival glue, putting that cigarette butt back in the painting. No kidding. So, I mean, it's really kind of farcical at some point when the artists don't care. Um, 
it's a little different than the, the environment that actually changes it. So that relates to um, the fetish object. And, and fetish um, is a term that I'll define for you. It's used in, at first we heard it in 1610, uh, and it was probably um, kind, of, kind of made up by Portuguese sailors. Um, and they would have been in the um, sort of business of trading charms and talismans that would have been worshiped by um, basically the natives of, of, of you know, the Guinea coast of Africa. So it was first popularized in anthropology um, in 1760, which actually influenced the way we spell it in English, fetish, right? Um, in the figurative sense, it's something irrationally revered, okay? So if we think that and we apply that to how we use it today, it can be a much more tensile term. Um, so the word is derived from the French fetiche um, or the Portuguese faitico, um, and in turn from the Latin fascitus. Facti, facticius. <laughs> Say it with me, all. Um, basically meaning artificial or to make. Um, it is weirdly an object that is presumed to have supernatural powers in, in the origin of the word, okay? So in particular, it's a man-made object that will have power over others. So essentially fetishism is the cultural appropriation of inherent value or the powers to an object. And the word has very strong colonialist and sexual connotations, which is why I've included these images here. Um, Charles Gouillet or Gouillet, he's an American, um, was known as the godfather of the American fetish art image, um, photographing for fetish imagery. Um, and so what that actually, and why that's appropriate and why it's you know, pertinent here is because many artists today who continue to make objects are called fetishists. Because at its core, philosophically, art is meant to live in the mind and the spirit, right? Um, the meaning is not derived by the object itself. It's derived by the idea. So, in graduate school, I heard a lot of stuff about being an art fetishist um, because I insist on making objects. So, you know, it might not be the most popular thing in the world today, but um, this in turn is the origin of that, of that kind of slander. So what we have here is um, a fetish object that, um, that is a West Indian um, talisman. And then what we have over to the right is actually a Greek evil eye. Um, when I was a high school student, um, one of my closest friends was Greek and she would go to, back to Greece on the, on, the, on the summers, in the summers. And she would bring us all back a little blue trinket that were all throughout Greece. And she would say, it's the evil eye. And we would always kind of laugh and stuff, but no, legitimately um, these things are sold throughout the world um, and not, you know, I, I saw them in Italy. And, and they're meant to protect you against curses. When you, when you anger someone, they will do certain things with their hands. This is the one that they would use in Italy. I'm giving you the evil eye. Uh, and it would be a curse upon you, right? And so the evil eye would, the, the charm would, would be thought to, 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 to heal you or protect you. Um, so I got a little thing here. Laura Gonzalez, a uh, theorist, takes Marx's definition of fetishism as the action of worshiping an inanimate object for its supposed magical powers. So Freud says it's the action of giving an excessive or irrational commitment of something to something or someone. So it's about going above and beyond the limits of what generally is deemed acceptable and to cross the point over to fantasy, right? Um, and, and, and of course, you know, spirituality plays, you know, sort of very movable force in that, depending on what your belief system is, right? Um, I think the most perfect object that embodies fetishism in terms of the art object is, um, you know, the Oppenheim fur tea set, right? You've all seen this? Yeah. Um, what is it meant to be indicative of? Not only the sort of um, salve or seduction or sensory pleasure that we get from looking at objects and handling objects, but also the sort of sexual nature. I mean, not to mince words here, but this is meant to be an allusion to um, pubic hair, right? A woman's pubic hair specifically because it's a vessel, right? 
Um, so it's a sort of play on the gaze. It's a play on how we view objects in and of itself, how we get titillation from that, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's the beginnings of us starting to look, Oppenheim's was the beginnings of us starting to look at objects in a negative way because it is intrinsically linked with capitalism. So what are the expectations concerning the artwork of a gallery director who represents the artist? Um, they don't want shoddy artworks, especially when they're selling these to their clientele. Um, the reputation and the credibility of the art dealer um, is definitely at stake and their longevity in the art world should be, would be short-lived. So the collector and the investor um, who has just purchased a work of art really is paying in good faith. So the expectation that this newly acquired work will last forever doesn't seem an unreasonable assumption. Um, so if something unforeseen does happen, such as fading, crackening, cr crackening or darkening, um, could the patron return it to the gallery and demand a refund? So yeah, that's still legally up in the air. There's no guarantee on that. If a gallery director says this artwork is behind museum glass and it's completely UV protected and it is not, I could see a good case for going after that gallery director because a lot of galleries now are actually, you know, part of the acquisition of works of art that go into museums, right? Tiburtonage in, you know, or in, in New York or Gagosian in London, all of these places are literally going, channeling the work right into major institutions, major museums. So, it's that's still up in the air and it is an ethical question. But for some artists, uh, the process is more important than the longevity. Um, of course, you all know Piero Manzoni's The Artist's Shit, the can of the artist's excrement. Um, and he did a whole slew of these, like, I don't know, two a day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for a long while. And in fact, he produced them as a series. Like there are like a hundred of these. There are literally like a hundred of these. Um, and so if you know a little bit about them, some of them started to corrode. I wonder why. And as they corrode, the contents of which start to come out of the tin can. And the tin can, of course, is, is about the experience. It's meant to be safely inside this can. So, uh, and this was, you know, way back when. So, all right. So, Performance art is a really good example of where the object doesn't matter so much. And I would think that this is a lot, this is really touching on performance art here, touching, no pun intended. Um, so cost can be a factor. Uh, students may opt for less expensive student grade uh, materials or hardware store supplies. I often still rely on that. Um, and because students are practicing uh, technique and expanding their personal voice, they may not necessarily require the longevity that, um, that a museum quality work would. Um, you never know when you're gonna make art history and Manzoni was starting to make art history when he made these. So the question next is, is the work for sale and will the work go into a collection? All right, so a lot of artists uh, have this as a privilege, right? Generally, we wanna maintain a certain sort of stability for that. Now. If you know the work is going to live in a public collection, like in a building, it, you know, you, it would require you to think about varnishes very differently. It will require you to think about the, the structure of the canvas, the stretcher bars themselves differently than you would in the studio making something for a painting, advanced painting class, right? Um, but most of the time, these sins are committed by improperly used materials, to be real. Um, so, what does that mean? Um, painting on an improperly prepared surface. So using like hardware store uh, kills instead of artists or museum quality gesso um, will oftentimes lead to paint flaking. Um, proper technique like fat over lean. That's just one of those rules, right? Um, when layers of paint aren't dry and paint is applied over that layer, that will create a kind of thing called crazing, um, which is a shrinking. It's uh, known as a crackler. 
where there are all those tiny little cracks are in the surface, right? That happens pretty immediately. That's happened to me when I have not observed um, the let it, wait for it to dry rule. Um, and it happened within a year of the creation of the work. And it was a large expansive area that it happened to. So I couldn't sell it. Um, sometimes student grade paint is made with filler and that filler is fugitive. It will not necessarily last the test of time, just to be honest. That's why it's called student grade. Um, the number one offender typically is oftentimes the support as well. So stretch, stretch canvas is what's called hygroscopic. It readily absorbs and gives off moisture. It is flexible, but the paint is not. Paint is not intended to move. In fact, traditional gesso should only go on wood panel or completely rigid surfaces rather than on canvases. What should go on canvas is acrylic because acrylic will move with the moisture. So uh, it, the best way to put that is to think of a, like a layer of peanut brittle on saran wrap and what happens when it, when it moves. Um, okay, artists are now using a substance called dye bond and I have included a picture in the lower part of this slide. Um, see that little landscape there? And what dye bond is, um, is two sheets of aluminum, pure aluminum in between a rigid foam interior. So it's like an Oreo with foam as your cream. And it will never ever warp. And it's completely rigid. And you can cut it. And it's about, you know, a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, it, it comes in varying thicknesses. But you can cut it with a carpenter's knife. And it can be a great solution for when you're trying to create rigid artworks that will last, not corrode, because it's aluminum. And if you properly prime it, it will not corrode. Um, that can be stored flat, much like paper. So it's cheaper to send as a flat pack, much like you would send flat pack furniture. So that's something for all of you to think about. I've also included a slide of aluminum strainers or stretcher bars. Do you see that? Um, those are primarily created for the use, uh, knowing that the work will, is going to live probably in a museum. But a lot of artists prefer to work on that because it will never ever warp. And so the structure and the integrity of the actual canvas itself is pulled taut and it's not ever going to move unless you poke the canvas, if that makes sense. So that little, um, that little uh, problem there in the upper left hand corner slide, um, that is, is really what I'm talking about in terms of a support structure moving. So another thing you want to think about is how are you storing your materials um, and your paintings themselves, so or drawings. In this case, what we've got here is a watercolor and a um, print. So the environment can really impact the longevity of your paint, um, your paintings. Uh, acrylic paints don't do well if they're frozen. So if you store your work in a freezing space and it's complete, they will separate, but also on a surface that will damage the surface of the painting. Um, it can be really, really reactive to heat and cold in general. Um, and it will crack. Acrylics can crack. What you're seeing here is actually an example of what's called foxing. And foxing is when a, a, a surface of paper starts to grow mold. And this has happened to a couple of my works in my garage. So watercolors that are in a frame in my garage because of the moisture living in the space constantly. And this is not something you can remove at all. You can't, you can't, well, an artist cannot remove. An archivist can remove it. They can remove it with a kind of bleach solution, but there's no guarantee that it won't alter it, you know, for a long time, especially if what you're trying to remove is over a painting is foxing over a painting. They've had to do this with Michelangelo drawings. Michelangelo drawings have a lot of foxing on them. The best way to really deal with this is to have some storage solutions. Y'all are going to have to start thinking about this when you graduate. Um, a flat file is one of the best things if you are going to be making works on paper. Um, you can store your paper in good condition. You don't have to roll it. They are not cheap. And so as an alternative, so as you start out, I would recommend what's called a clamshell uh, acid-free box. 
which you can get from any art supply store. And that's what you see over to the left there. I have several of these to store my paintings. Um, they are not super rigid like a, um, like a flat file, but a flat file will pretty much keep it kind of a little free, a freer from the humidity as an issue. Um, and as you know, you know, the corners, once the corners are bent, the corners are bent, uh, piece of paper. So, um, yeah, okay. A lot of people don't think about archival inks. A lot of painters will make their living off of selling prints of their work nowadays, especially on Instagram. Both of you probably thought about this. Um, you want to ensure that those prints that you sell, um, if they are additioned, are made from archival ink and not our all ink is created equally. The printer ink that comes out of your printer is not necessarily going to last forever. So you have to do a little research. It will require you to do a little research. Also student grade inks that they sell at the art supply store. Not meant to last forever most of the time. Uh, black inks will fade to brown and then very, very, very light yellow if they're really exposed to the light, depending on the cheapness of the production quality. Adhesives, uh, if you continue to paint on canvases or you start to make your own, um, this is something you want to begin to think about. A PVA, it sounds like a fancy pants name, polyvinyl acetate, is just Elmer's glue. Elmer's is just a name brand. It's a kind of wheat glue. And that wheat glue can be used in order to make a book, if you've taken Shelley's, you know, book binding stuff, right? Um, wheat glue is used oftentimes in uh, kind of an alternative to graffiti where you make posters and then you wheat glue it to a, a space and then eventually the, it will degrade off, right? So these binders are, are perfectly fine to use on cloth, paperboard, um, anything really, um, but they won't work in semi-porous or non-porous surfaces. So you can't use something like Elmer's glue on something like dye bond, right? Aluminum, plastics. So if you're gonna use plastics or acrylics, you say you're putting acrylic and collage into a painting, you wouldn't really want to use school glue. You probably want to use clear acrylic, matte medium, things like that. So you have to really, really think about the movability of the adhesive that you're actually using. I have used, I had to hurry up and produce a show very, very quickly. And I did all these oil on paint, oil on pa prepared paper paintings. So I gessoed the paper over and over and over again, and then you can do oil on that because it's gessoed. I then sprayed them using a permanent fixative that said it was archival and adhered them to wood panel and then carefully trimmed them down. When they got to the location that I was having the exhibit, half of them were peeling off because of the moisture that the um, that the wood held and the paper did not. So they resisted. So clear acrylic probably would have been the best way to, to glue it, even though the paintings were made out of oil, if that makes sense, because the opposite side was not prepared with gesso and it was porous. So a porous to porous surface really needs a, an immovable thick layer of glue. And you'll all figure that out with mistakes generally. So, all right, when you store artwork, um, you do not want to store it in plastics that will degrade. Most of the plastics that you buy at Walmart, even the art supply store, will degrade in time. And you don't think that's going to happen in your lifetime, but it will. Um, so you want to make sure that what you buy to actually hold your art and move your art is not going to have a chemical reaction with your art. This is a thing. Um, so, you know, the standard things about avoiding direct sunlight always go, um, you make sure you st always store your, your, your canvases and painting canvas prints and paintings upright closets are great for this. Um, you want to make sure they're in a cool, dry place. So you, if you're doing, if you're doing a storage space, you want to make sure it's not one of those outdoor storage space that it's cl climate controlled. Yes, you will have to pay extra for that. Um, and you want to you wanna avoid putting anything on the floor. All of your canvases should not actually sit directly on your floor for a number of reasons. Flooding being number one. But honestly, 
moisture will go up into your canvas, it will live there, and it will mold. And you cannot get mold off of a canvas. You can't throw it in the, in the washer. You can't scrape it off. And once it starts to smell or create black mold, you pretty much have to get rid of that art object. So when you store artworks on the floor, this is why people have pallets in their studios and keep the work up on a pallet on the floor. Cinder blocks are okay, I suppose, but really something that is gonna be dry and it's gonna keep the works away from any moisture wicking, right? Uh, when you choose to work with certain materials, as you start to sell, you want to research their archival rating. Each, each um, material that you would find in an art supply store has an archival rating. Sometimes it will have a light fastness rating if it's paint, which means uh, this red paint can sit directly in the sunlight for 10 times more than this red paint over here, right? It'll have a little star, um, or the star is simply... Um, you know, the quality itself, it will last much longer than something that's just a cheaper grade. All right, let's talk about varnishing. Um, there are three main rules to varnishing. Um, is it a dry painting? Is it a clean painting? And how thin can you go? The thinner, the better, okay? So the four main types of varnishes are spray varnish for acrylic, for acrylic paintings. There's liquid varnish for acrylic that you can paint on. There is um, spray varnish for oil, which is like a Damar varnish. Damar is a, a kind of, um, it's a pine solvent kind of, it's taken from pine trees. Um, and there's liquid varnish for oil paintings, the kind, those really satisfying Instagram videos you see of people washing their paintings. Um, use only acrylic with acrylic and oil with oil, okay? Do not use the same brush for both, ever, 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 okay? Throw away the brush. If it's destroyed, don't use it for something else. Um, okay. When you finish an acrylic painting, a lot of people do is what they call a sort of protective layer. They do a very, very thin layer of clear acrylic before they actually put a, 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 a sheen varnish on it. And of course, you know that sheens come in varying degrees. Some are matte, some are satin, and some are glossy. So an acrylic barrier layer is not meant to have a sheen on it. But what it will do is it will increase the actual thickness to further protect it in a way that um, if it gets poked, if it gets scratched, right, it will not actually, um, you'll be able to actually remove the varnish. Every varnish should be removable. If your varn, and you, you, they do sell them, they sell varnishes that are not removable. You wanna ensure that the varnish that you get is removable because varnish will and should yellow. A lot of people think that this is a thing you don't want. It means, that that layer is absorbing any of the environmental um, pollu pollutants versus the painting itself. And you wanna be able to take that off because it's far easier to take off the varnish than to clean the painting. It takes months and months and months to clean a painting. Do you understand that? Okay. Um, of course, it's all very, very satisfying when you see a sheen because it, 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 you know, we would varnish a painting for a number of reasons. Um, Traditionally, we use them to keep, keep our paintings protected from dust, smoke, dirt, etc., cetera, um, and the atmosphere in general. Uh, the varnish, though, is a non-porous protective layer that is removable for cons conservation purposes, and it serves its aesthetic purpose whilst also providing protection. So any dirt that attaches to the actual painting is on the varnish layer and not embedded in the paint layer. So when a painting is yellowed and looks suitably dirty, the varnish can be removed and all the dirt with it. Um, you never want to leave a painting unvarnished, especially if it's, it's living somewhere permanently. So the main reasons why an artist would varnish their work is to deepen and saturate the colors. It's magical, um, absolutely magical. I would highly recommend a book called The Craftsman's Handbook by Sanino Sanini, and it's the, one of the oldest ones. Um, 
he tried many, many times to create a matte varnish to his paintings. He created a recipe for varnish from whipped egg whites um, and it worked. But the only issue is, is that it went pretty gray over time. Uh, when the Renaissance had a more high gloss finish that was favored, um, we know that as the old master glow, um, it gives a, a sort of permanent enrichment to the colors. You can see that, especially on the image to the right there. Um, acrylic paintings are incredibly dull. They really blossom when a, uh, when a varnish is put on them. <clears throat> the other reason we would want to varnish a painting is to create an even surface of the entire um, canvas or panel. And the reason why is because a, a, a phenomenon known as blooming occurs where different paint colors will react differently as they dry, creating a, an inconsistent surface quality. So that quality might be shiny over here on the black and really, really matte over here on the, on the, on the baby blue. And you've all seen it, I'm sure. So when there's an inconsistent sheen, it looks as if the painting is damaged. And so I've got a little image here on your slide of the varying surface um, surfaces. And the big thing is, is um, well, we'll talk about how to do that in a second. Um, the other reason is to protect the surface from the atmospheric effects and make it just simply easier to clean. And what you see there in that slide is someone pushing the paint with his thumb. And that is the test to see if it is dry. Because as you know, oil paint will dry as a skin versus the underneath, which will be pliable and movable and still wet. And so you never actually want to varnish a painting when it's still in that movable state, when you can still squish it around with your thumb, ever. In fact, you want to make, wait a full year, maybe two, before you do an oil varnish over oil. What will happen? It will crack. Or because it has a solvent on it, and you're basically painting a solvent on, on paint that's not wet, that's not dry yet, you may remove entire portions of your painting. I have done this. Take it from one who knows. So avoid, avoid, avoid painting a varnish on a dry, a, a, a wet work. And what do you use instead? You use a retouch varnish. So when you show, you produce work really, really quick. You use spray retouch varnish. You can also use um, paint on retouch varnish. Um, Sinvar is my favorite brand. It's produced by Gamblin. Sinvar. All right. So way back when in the 19th century, the French Academy, um, before the day before the salon exhibition, artists were actually allowed a varnishing day in house. Uh, this was often carried out by the artist color men. And what is a color man? A color man is the man who actually sells the pigments to the artists, who procures and trades and, you know, sells. Uh, this, this would have been a sort of assistant role, but they would have done this to ensure the quality of their work. This was a sort of good, good faith thing. Um, Cezanne's art dealer, Vollard, or Vollard, quotes Renoir from 1879. The day before the opening, a friend came and told me that he had just been to the salon and that something queer seemed to have happened to my Mademoiselle Samory. I dashed to the salon and found the picture almost beyond recognition. It looked as if it were melting away. It seems that the framer instructed the delivery boy to varnish another picture that he was delivering at the same time. The boy had a little varnish left over and decided to give me the benefit of it. I didn't varnish mine because it was still wet but he thought I was being economical. The result was that I had to paint the whole thing in an afternoon. So when I say that, I mean it, it will literally melt off. <laughs> the substrate is one of the last things you wanna consider uh, as we wrap up, um, but there are a couple of things here that you wanna know about. Um, the glues that I referenced, rabbit skin glue, comes in a sort of sandy form. It is indeed rabbit skin. You use boiling water and you keep it at a certain temperature. So I would recommend things like a hot plate because you don't really want to boil rabbit skin glue on your stove because ew, it smells, it's gross. It's like, it's basically gelatin. It makes like gelatin. Um, a hot plate and a temperature gauge, like a, a, what are those called? The candy thermometer would be great. Something like that. So you can tell that it is staying uh, the temperature it needs to because it actually has to be a certain temperature. 
Um, then there's polyvinyl acetate, which is very simple, right? It's that, it's, it's that white glue. And then there's wheat paste, which is just flour and water essentially, and can be used as a priming barrier. Um, then we have gesso. What you think conventionally is gesso is not actually gesso. It's acrylic. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, an, it's a petroleum distillate. It actually comes from like gasoline, right? Oil. Um, and we don't know how long it'll last. I'm gonna be real with you. Um, but real gesso is comprised of gypsum, which comes from the earth, chalk, or marble dust, one of those three things. They're not all the same thing. And then rabbit skin glue. And it only is meant to go on a rigid support like wood panel or aluminum, something that will never ever move. Because if it does move, like it's put on canvas, it will absolutely guarantee it crack horribly. Then we have a primer, which is different than gesso. Don't use the terms interchangeably, they're not. Um, and a primer is the barrier layer. So on a canvas, a primer layer is not the rabbit skin glue, it's the lead white that you work on. And they sell lead priming white and non-lead priming white. And of course, as you know, don't eat lead. It's really dangerous and toxic. Um, I try not to use real lead. Um, a tone, so the, the formula or recipe for toning a canvas or panel is 50-50 alkyd medium. So your gambling or gal, your um, galkid or your, what do you all use? You use a, a, like a jelly. What's the brand of that? Your medium, liquid. So it's an alkyd medium, 50% alkyd medium, 50% color. I just put brute sienna in there because it's easy to remember that. Um, your substrates, MDF is not an archival substrate. What is MDF? Um, it is medium density fiberboard. It's what your bookshelves are probably made of. It's what Ikea furniture is made of. And it's press board, right? It's the wood is all chipped up, it's put in a form and it's made into a stiff form. It seems like a good idea to paint on. It is not, it's, it's got all sorts of chemicals on it that will actually degrade the painting over time. That's why I have nope, nope, nope after it. Um, plywood is perfectly fine. Plywood is actual wood and it's no longer produced with um, uh, terrible chemicals. Birch panel is the best because it's lightweight and you have to, have to, have to cradle it. It will warp. Linen or canvas covered panels work as well, or uh, just simply a reinforced cradle or strainer uh, with, your, with your wood panel. Um, various canvases that you might not know about other than cotton duck and linen are polyester, which is plastic. Polyester is made of plastic and Tyvek. Tyvek is what they wrap houses in for weatherproofing. Did you all know about this? It is completely archival. You can buy it in enormous sheets. It is stretchable as you can see evidenced on the side of a building, right? When they wrap it and staple it up there. It is virtually indestructible. You have to, you have to carve at it in order to get it cut. So it doesn't cut as easily as something like canvas. So it will, it will stand the test of time. It is archival and it's really hard to poke a hole in, really hard. And then of course your protective measures uh, I already addressed, varnishes, frames, good frames are important, uh, wires, wiring your work properly. And then of course a cleat. And a cleat is what you use when your work is rigid without a strainer, but just a flat support. So I've got a picture over here to the right of a work that's straight up and down. And what a cleat does is it prevents anybody from being able to take it down. It does not move with the wall. Any vibration will not affect it. And it's, it's just hard to steal. It's hard to steal and it will be there permanently. So that's, that's a cleat. Those are very easy to make. Consider that instead of wire, because all you got to do is just put two screws in it or even glue it. So in closing, it's up to you. Uh, I chose this wonderful picture of Picasso and his tidy whities um, because he, he lives on in infamy, but also in, in perpetuity. His works were created archivally. So you want to consider your purpose and your intention behind crafting of an object. Um, do you want it to last? Where do you want it to live? Um, do you want it to live in the memory exclusively? Do you want to live, it to, live in a museum or simply a household? Um, 
why make objects in the 21st century? That should be the biggest question that you have from this chat. As nerdy and boring as archival practices are, why do you choose to make objects in a world where everything is ultimately um, no longer about objects? Um, and then what does that experience convey? Once you're gone, you're gone. You're never to create another work again. So what do you want to remain? I'm gonna end the show. And then I'm gonna admit Madison because she's here now. And I'm gonna stop recording. Okay. Did you say that varnish, is it this? Uh, like with the blue kind of? I don't know if that'll, that will fix.